Spring 2020 brings exclusive editions of Jesus Always and Jesus Calling to your local Sam's Club. Featuring a leather soft cover with comfortable print size and written out Bible verses, find these exclusive editions of Jesus Always and Jesus Calling at your local Sam's Club today. We're all made in the image of God, and the image of God in me is, is the same as the image of God in you, the image of God in everybody around the world. God made us all in the same image of one God. So we all have the ability to have a relationship with God, to understand His Word, to hear His voice, uh, to express His love. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Our guests this week have found power in recognizing that though we appear to be different, we are all created in God's image and for His glory. Pastor and former NFL player Miles McPherson and entrepreneur Derek Evans. First up, Miles McPherson is the founder and has pastored the vibrant Rock Church in San Diego, California for the last 20 years. During college, Miles played football and got drafted into the NFL. During his time as a player, he hit a low with drug abuse that caused him to reassess the direction his life was headed. Miles knew he needed to give his life back to God, and when he did, everything changed. After he left the NFL, he went on to start his church and to become an important voice for racial unity in the world, especially among Christians, which he talks about in his latest book, The Third Option, Hope for a Racially Divided Nation. I'm Miles McPherson, uh, former NFL player, now pastor of the Rock Church in San Diego. Married three kids and one grandchild who's four years old and author of The Third Option. I went to Catholic school from first to eighth grade, and, and so I learned to fear of God in Catholic school. And so I knew about God. I knew about the fear of God. I knew about the Ten Commandments. I, I had a, a high level of respect for God. And I have never said the, God's name in vain because I learned that was a sin. Lying was really hard for me because I learned it was a sin. Uh, but other stuff, you know, I was getting high and sleeping around, but there was still something in me that acknowledged there was a God and it was right and wrong. So when I heard about Jesus and a relationship, that made sense to me because it was more than religion and rules. It was relationship. Of course, God would want that. And so that, that made a lot of sense to me. When I was 10 years old, I started playing football in Pop Warner, played four years. I played through high school, college. I went to a Division three school, uh, so no scholarship, very small college. They had never had a winning season. I didn't get a scholarship out of high school. And I was the first All-American in the history of that school, and then I got drafted to the NFL. I had a coach who believed I could play in the NFL. So did I, but I kind of had a little doubt. He sent flyers to every NFL team for my whole senior year, every week. And then after the season, some teams came and watched film. They never saw me play live. And I got drafted to the Los Angeles Rams from the University of New Haven, came here to California, uh, got cut from that team. And every NFL preseason, you have tryouts. Um, and it's about six weeks long. And back then, every week, they would cut about 10 guys because you start with about 100 guys. I got cut, the last cut. Um, then there was an the NFL strike. This was in 1982, and no one was playing football. So I was miserable up here. Just I wasn't on a team, didn't know what was going to happen with my life. Then the season restarted, and I signed with the San Diego Chargers. I played four years with the San Diego Chargers, and um, during my first year, I started doing cocaine. I had been smoking marijuana since high school, but cocaine was something I vowed never to do. And I started doing cocaine because some of the guys on the team were doing it in the hotel. Uh, I did that for two years. Uh, and, you know, I never, I never played high, but I, after practice, um, after the games, and during the week, during the off season, I was getting high all the time. And, and it was an emptiness in my life because I was doing, doing what I always dreamt to do. I, my dream had come true, but yet there was something missing in my life. I went to a crack house with my teammate who was doing crack, and I didn't do crack, but I did power cocaine, and I was watching him smoke this rock and his eyes would go back in his head and, and I was sitting there going, you know, what am I doing with my life? I was doing cocaine on a team plane in the bathroom of the team plane, walking down the aisle of the plane and guys were doing Bible study on our team plane and they shared the gospel with me and I watched them, the Christians on our team. They had a very strong witness and very vocal. Every NFL team has a uh, a Christian contingent. They all have chapels. They all have chapel before the game. They all have Bible study during the week. And so there was a group on our team and I watched them and knew that what they had I wanted. So 
and I said, okay, God, I got to give my life to you again, but recommit my life and say, I'm going to do it. But for those five years, I was thinking about it. And God was whispering to me pretty much every day, whenever you're ready, whenever you're ready. Uh, whenever you're ready, that's going to be the girl you marry. Whenever you're ready, I'm going to get you off these drugs. And I just kept saying, ah, you know, one more day, one more day. And just dragged it out for five years, pretty much. And so April 12, 1984, I was laying on my couch, five o'clock in the morning. I had been doing cocaine all night. And my heart was pounding out of my chest. Thought I was going to have a heart attack. And I just said, okay, Lord, I'm just going to give my life to you. And that day I stopped doing cocaine, stopped smoking marijuana. My girlfriend and I, who I met in college in Connecticut, was now living in California. We got back together that day, and we've been together ever since. Yeah, and you know, the big difference for me was having people in my life to hold me accountable and, and just be there to be an example and a role model for me, because I had no one. I didn't know any Christians. I went to, to the NFL and didn't know any. I started meeting a couple here, a couple there, but there wasn't somebody that I really looked up to that could guide me in the right direction until I went to the Chargers and, the, and guys came onto the team that um, spoke to me about it. Once I decided that I was gonna give my life to the Lord, that was it. And, and I stopped doing cocaine that day. And um, then I asked the guys on the team to disciple me. Well, one, I was asking guys questions about the Bible, about God. And, and one of the guys who I kept asking questions of, he said, you need to get disciples. And I said, well, what is that? And he said, someone will sit down and teach all this. I said, well, well will you disciple me? And he said, no. <laughs> and I was mad. <laughs> I was like, how could you say no? And he said, you should ask this other guy named Sherman. So I asked him and he said, I'll pray about it, which to me sounded like a Christian way of saying, I'll think about it. <laughs> but he said yes. And he met with me um, every Tuesday was our day off. He met with me every Tuesday for three hours, me and two other guys. And that changed my life. I played two more years, so I played four total. And in my last two years, obviously I wasn't Getting high, I was walking with God, and my next year I was a starter. Then I got hurt, had surgery, one more year. My injury ended my career pretty much. But then I started youth ministry, and I started speaking in schools, and started a Bible study in my house with kids in my neighborhood, I started going to prisons. Fast forward 16 years, we started the Rock Church in 2000. So we're 19 years old as a church. Um, and then I wrote this book called The Third Option uh, because of all the division in our country. You know, every race conversation is about us versus them. And the third option is that we honor what we have in common. And uh, we are all 99.5% genetically identical. And if we focus on and acknowledge and focus on what we have in common, the one thing of ethnicity that's different will actually be a benefit and not a cause of division because God made us different because he's a creative God and he's into variety. But in fact, we have so many countless things that are are identical. Uh, and so the book is about how can we learn how to honor one another through and amidst all this racial division in the world. So I wanted to give people tools on how to do that and how to understand their own blind spots and how to understand uh, how people perceive them. And so we can break through the walls that racism has built up between us. Every time you see someone, rename them neighbor. You know, the greatest commandment is to love God with your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is just like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So I am biblically obligated to love you as my neighbor. And the Good Samaritan story tells us that everybody's my neighbor. So I have to love you as my neighbor. And I have to love you as myself. But if I rename you something less than neighbor, I don't need to love you. And so when we look at people and we put all these labels on them that dehumanize them, and then we liberate ourselves from the obligation of having to love them because they're not on our level. And when we watch the news, the news gives us those labels and social media gives us those labels. And then once you attach a label to someone that is less than neighbor, less than brother, you dehumanize them and you can't relate to them above that label. And so the first thing you can do is say, that's my neighbor. And so if we would just start there and then talk about people through the lens of neighbor or brother or sister, we wouldn't say a lot of the things we say. We're commanded by God to love people. We are commanded to say the, the number one thing you can do is love me and just like it is you gotta love your neighbor. If you can't do those two things, that's this whole book is about that. 
So here's a whole group of people that you got issue with, okay? We're the ones that have to come together. God is love and we have God. So we have to represent love in the most unselfish way possible. And one of the most visible ways is when people see you loving people that don't look like you <laughs> and, and possibly don't have anything in common with you other than, you know, the fact that you made the image of God. Miles has a mission to help people come together despite their perceived differences from one another. He reads a passage from Jesus Calling and then reiterates that although we are all made uniquely for His glory, it's important for us to find that thing we all have in common, that we're made in God's image. July 20th from Jesus Calling. Don't be afraid to be different from other people. The path I have called you to travel is exquisitely right for you. The more closely you follow my leading, the more fully I can develop your gifts. To follow me wholeheartedly, you must relinquish your desire to please other people. However, your closeness to me will bless others by enabling you to shine brightly in this dark world. God says, I've done this for all of you. That's what we all have in common. Yet you are unique. That's what we all have in common. God made us unique for His glory. He made us all the same so we can all be a family. The third option is focusing on what we all have in common. And I would challenge all your viewers as they look at, meet people, homeless people, people that are in the furthest socioeconomic level from them, people that uh, have the furthest difference in education from them, that they're all made in His image. And there's something great in them that God is trying to call out. And if we can be part of that, we can live out the third option and bring unity to our world. To learn more about the ministry of Miles McPherson or to buy his book, please visit milesmcpherson.com. Stay tuned to Derek Evans' story after a brief message about a beautiful new edition of Jesus Calling that's a perfect way to help you celebrate the Easter season. The Easter season is filled with joy and hope. Now, there's a new way to focus on the holiday with the new book, Jesus Calling for Easter. With 50 Jesus Calling devotions selected just for the Lent and Easter season, Jesus Calling for Easter includes scripture verses alongside breathtaking imagery and exquisite design. Jesus Calling for Easter makes a stunning gift for those who love Jesus Calling and would like a new way to observe the Easter season. To learn more about this beautiful new edition of Jesus Calling, please visit jesuscalling.com books. From the time he was a little boy, Derek Evans knew his purpose was to make a difference for the least of these. As he grew older, Derek searched for a way to put his mission into action. But it wasn't until he and a friend founded a t-shirt company that he found a way to make a difference for those in need in his community, but even for others all the way across the globe. Well, my name is Derek Evans, um, originally from Indianapolis, Indiana, born and raised throughout uh, right after college. And then I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and started a company called Project 615. And uh, we're actually a t-shirt and apparel company that has a mission to help people. We've been doing that going on 10 years and seen a lot of awesome, beautiful growth here in this great city. So we grew up kind of inner city in downtown Indianapolis. And my parents were just kind of your classic blue collar family and something that I'm extremely grateful for. And you know, it was the 80s and my, my mom and dad had three children. I was the middle child. And, and you know, having three kids in your 20s is, is not always the easiest. And so one of my first memories, I was about four or five years old and I went with my mother to the grocery store to pick up a few groceries for, for the family. And we go and get the things and we get ready to check out. And it's the same lady that we've seen there all the time. My mom did not have enough money to pay for the groceries of the food and, and things that we needed. And and the lady basically said, I'm sorry, like, I'm not going to give you these groceries. You don't have enough money. And my mom's like counting pennies in her purse and she's still coming up short. And the lady's getting aggravated with my mom and my mom starts crying. And I just remember being like, wow, like, and I think really for the first time in my life, even being a four or five year old, the real compassion kind of kicked in. And I was just like, man, whatever I can do to, to help my mom or to help others, to help people, I want to make sure that people 
have an opportunity to be helped. And so and that was really one of the first moments and it's kind of stuck with me throughout my whole life. So how I got to Nashville is uh, somewhat of an interesting yet quick story. <laughs> we, I had nearly every job under the sun in college, after college, and I was at a, a construction management company. It was the middle of 2008. I recently just got a raise, got my own office. I thought I was living the high life, right? Not too long after I got the raise, got my own office, the uh, owner of the company knocked on my door, walked in and said, hey, we're actually firing you because we need to save some money. And it's kind of funny because in that moment, I, I knew one person in Nashville, a good friend of mine from college, and I just felt God in that moment say, you're moving to Nashville. About six days later, I was in Nashville. Um, I was excited. You know, I'm a person that anytime there's change in my life, I'm more excited than fearful because I know that God always uses those opportunities to really strengthen us. It was really about a year and a half to two years of the Lord really molding me. I didn't have any, any nearby family. I didn't have many friends. I didn't have any money. I was single. My car broke down. I didn't have a car. And truly, really rock bottom for the first time in my life. And, and again, you know, the, the beautiful thing about being rock bottom is, is that, that God truly uses that time to, to really mold you, to really speak to you, to really transform your life. And so for me, it was a lot of days spent on my knees in prayer. And for the first time, and, and, I, and I grew up in a Christian home, uh, went to, to Christian camps, went to a Christian university. And so, but here I was about 24, 25 years old uh, for the first time, just on my knees, just seeking the Lord and saying, Lord, why, why me? What is going on? What are you doing? And I'm so grateful for that time because if I didn't go through that time, I wouldn't be the man I am today. I found a, a really awesome church in Nashville that is still home for me today. And I ended up meeting some friends around the same age as me, and they invited me to, to go serve the homeless downtown Nashville with this ministry called the Bridge Ministry that feeds and loves on and serves the homeless population in downtown Nashville. And so we fed them, had a worship service, and then the volunteers actually prayed with some of the homeless people that wanted prayer. And I'll never forget this. It was my turn to stand up as a volunteer to pray with this man who requested some prayer. And so me and the, the friends that I met down there prayed with this man and were praying over him. And for the first time in my life, I felt God say, you're no different than this man who you're praying for. And that was when compassion sparked and I wanted to live a life that really gave people second chances and really gave people hope and, and really love on the least of these because that's what Christ has called us to do. So I began entering into the entrepreneurial arena and I had a good friend from college Matt, we went to the same Christian college in Anderson, Indiana, and we were in the same Christian fraternity. And he was a graphic designer. He ended up moving to Kentucky. He was uh, like, hey, I'll come down to Nashville for the weekend. And, and so I was like, hey, I've got this idea. As you know, I'm unemployed. I can't get a job. I want to start a business. What do you think? <laughs> and, and, and funny enough, he said, that's a great idea. I was like, huh? Really? He's like, yeah. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, we could do this. We could do this. We could do this. I was like, wait a second. You're right. <laughs> we can do this. And he's like, I'd love to help. I'd love to be a part of this. And we thought about everything. We wanted to write a book about Indiana high school basketball. We wanted to write comedy. Um, we wanted to make logos for people. And then we eventually settled on making t-shirts. And so a few months in, we saw some traction and we were really excited. And so I had an opportunity to go with my church to Los Angeles to go on a mission trip to feed the homeless. And Matt did not attend my church, but he said he would like to, to go with me. And I was like, oh, that'd be great. Yeah, let's do it. And so the trip ended up being one of those really, truly life-changing weeks for us. We saw people that have lived there before and then now we're business people 
that were now pastors, that were now leading nonprofits. And so we were able to see God's grace and mercy in a three-dimensional way. And so being able to see that transformation of people, we are really blown away by what God can do. Seeing God's restoration was incredible. We were like, you know that t-shirt company we're, we're trying to launch? What if we make this more of a mission company, a, a company that really helps people? What we told each other early on is that we wanted to make products that people actually wear. We want to make great products that have a two-part mission. We're giving some of our profits away to local nonprofits that are making a kingdom impact locally and globally. And we also want to give the gift of second chances. We want to give people who society tells no. We want to give them an opportunity to be a part of something greater than themselves. So we've given away over half a million dollars to different nonprofits here in Nashville. And we've also been able to hire over 55 people that are recovering from homelessness, addiction, and mental illness. Uh, in 2018, um, we were at our annual retreat with all of our employees, and we were coming up with different goals for the year. And um, we, we threw out the idea of, you know, what do we really want to do? We're this company that people uh, knows of, that gives back, that really impacts the world. But what can we really do this year that really kind of propels us into um, this, this company that really makes a difference? There are several people that said, you know what, we should build an orphanage in a third world country. And everybody kind of was like, yes, that's it. Like we, yeah, that's, that's an awesome idea. And so we all kind of agreed that in 2018, we wanted to build an orphanage in a third world country. We created a t-shirt. We let our fans and followers and customers know that we had this goal of $25,000. And at the end of it, as soon as we raise the money, if we raise the money, this home is going to be built just in a matter of days in this city in Uganda. We had two months to raise the funds. We had about uh, a few weeks go by, we had about another few days left. And so we were still short about $8,000. And so we made an extra push and all of a sudden, some people started pushing it themselves. Like our customers got behind it and really was tagging different celebrities, different musicians in town. And I kid you not, at the very last hour of the very last day, we came up with $25,000. And it was such a really, really awesome thing. And just a few days later that the home was being built. And to this day, 18 boys who were orphans, living on the streets, in the bushes, uh, are now in this home that's being ran by, by a bunch of Christians in Uganda. And so, and, and that's why we started this business again, is to, to to do our part and change in the world and give people second chances. God calls us to different things. And not only does he call us to different things, he plants different gifts and talents inside of us that he uses to further his kingdom. And so whatever that may be, I think that we have to be obsessed with pursuing that as much as we can, because if you are stuck in a job that you don't feel like you're making an impact, certainly pray about it. What is God calling you to do? And then what is something that has never really left you? What is something that you constantly think of? And it's like, oh, you know, I just don't know if I can do that. But if God has called you to do that, you need to be obsessed with pursuing that wholeheartedly. Everyone now, it just seems that now that we're so connected, that life is extremely busy for all people. And life is exceptionally busy for people who are running growing businesses. And so if I don't reflect and read through devotions like Jesus Calling and journal and, and write out my prayers and spend time with the Lord, I'm going to be a wreck, really, because the rest of the day controls me. And so for 15 to 30 minutes a day, that's the one time where I'm able to control that time and I'm able to really, truly spend that time with the Lord and hear from Him and be reminded of His grace and mercy. And I know a lot of people aren't morning people. And if that's you at night, if that's you in your car at lunch, if that's Saturday morning, if that's Friday night, whatever it is, I mean, you have to make sure that you're doing that to be able to take care of your soul. Jesus calling July 23rd, I am the light of the world. 
Men crawl through their lives, cursing the darkness, but all the while I am shining brightly. I desire each of my followers to be a light bearer. The Holy Spirit who lives in you can shine from your face, making me visible to people around you. Ask my spirit to live through you as you wind your way through this day. Hold my hand in joyful trust, for I never leave your side. The light of my presence is shining upon you. Brighten up the world by reflecting who I am. This connects with me so much professionally and personally because that's why this business exists, is to use our platform to be the light in our community and around the world. And so for me also as a businessman, how can I use what Christ has called me to do to use this platform that he's given us to truly uh, shine his light onto others? And so for me, being able to be the light as a businessman, as somebody in the community, and really leading the company, I think is impactful because I believe that the world is dark. So we must be the light as Jesus calls us to be. Find out more about Project 615 at project615.org and learn more about Derek's story in his new book, Made to Change the World. If you'd like to hear more stories about caring for our neighbors, check out our interview with Joanne Rogers, wife of Mr. Rogers. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we talk with author and speaker, Lisa Bevere. As she speaks around the world, Lisa's mission is to lift up women, no matter where they are, and remind them of the God-given strength they have right at this moment. You know, I think it's so fascinating that God is strong, but a lot of times women think, okay, but strong is wrong because we have actually associated strength with the things that would be ungodly anger, punishment, rebellion, but strength is actually this incredibly beautiful expression of God in our life. And a lot of times women do not understand that strong is not wrong for them. You not only have the right, you have permission from God to be strong. Do you love hearing these stories of faith weekly from people like you whose lives have been changed by a closer walk with God? then be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling Stories of Faith podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like what you're hearing, leave us a review so that we can reach others with these inspirational stories. And you can also see these interviews on video as part of our original web series, with a new interview premiering every other Sunday on Facebook Live. Find previously broadcast interviews on our YouTube channel on IGTV or on JesusCalling.com slash video.